Hi, this is Rob Marshall, director of Memoirs of a Geisha. And John DeLuca. I'm the co-producer and choreographer. And second unit director, John. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's an invaluable part of the process. And uh, we're here watching um, our movie. It's very exciting to be here together. Um, we worked on this project for what, John? Two years all together? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, um, Two hard, long years. <laughs> and wonderful years, unbelievably yes. rewarding. And it was an honor, I have to say, an honor to, um, to bring Arthur Golden's incredible novel to the screen. I mean, I really, when I look at this, I think of his work because this all came from him. And he's such a master. This was his first novel, which, when you think about it, is quite extraordinary. And um, obviously, this is uh, all seen through this young child's perspective, as you see her open up the open up the curtain to see what's going on. And um, that's how Arthur wrote it. Actually, it, it was interesting, John. He uh, he he said to me um, that he wrote this three times. The first time he wrote it, the first two times he wrote it in third person, and it wasn't until he wrote it from the first person as a child, uh, seen through her eyes and through her voice that he really felt it came to life. Rob really insisted on having this scene start in Japanese. We had shot it also in English. We have these two wonderful actors here and everybody spoke Japanese in these scenes, so I just felt that we needed to enter a completely foreign and unique world and also be in this position where you feel discombobulated and as young Chio does here she doesn't know what's happening in her life and uh, she's disoriented as we are as viewers hopefully that's the wonderful actor Mako playing her old father old Sakamoto he was incredible in the sand pebbles John so many great movies mm. this opening was um, incredibly hard to to create because there's so much rich material at the beginning of this novel and both Robin Swicord and I worked very closely with uh, Arthur Golden trying to figure out how we would condense the opening of this movie, um, condense the novel so we could put it in the movie and um, it was not easy. Uh, there's so much rich material but really thought that being ripped from her family was sort of the first sort of violent act that changes uh, and thrusts her, her life forward into a completely different world. There are also many more words here, much more dialogue that Rob chose to just delete and just really move this at a breakneck speed. Mm -hmm. I, think the, I, think, I think the beginning of a movie is so key. I actually learned that in theater from, uh, from Hal Prince. <laughs> Funnily enough, how important the first 10 minutes of anything is because it really sets the tone and the world and the energy and the movement of something. And um, I think that's something that's so true about film. And now we hear, um, for the first time, English. This is our narrator. And um, this is the older Sayuri's voice. And it's almost as if she's translating her story for us now. We've heard the Japanese up until now, and now we begin to hear this, um, this story told in English. For the Western world. Mm-hmm. The first time I knew my mother... And then from then on, uh, the dialogue is all in English, and the story is sort of told to us that way. It's interesting, I see these two train stations, we shot this actually up in uh, Sacramento, if you can believe it. Um, and they were literally 100 yards from each other. The train station she gets on and the train station she gets off, it's the same train. And now we're in our Hanamachi, which um, is this, was the, was the incredible set that we built. John Meyer, our production designer, created this world for us. Um, and it was very difficult because we wanted to shoot in Japan, but we found that there were very few areas that had a series of streets that still 
look like they did. And this is this takes place in 1929 here. And so we realized early on that we were going to have to build. Um, and of course, shoot in Japan for for many things that were untouched by modern times, like gardens and shrines and temples and things. There she is. Yes, the entrance of uh, Gong Li, the great, great actress from China, so well known, and um, it's the first geisha we see in the movie as well. She floats off into the night. She does. What, what, what they call it, uh, butterfly of the night. It's very. You can still feel this um, when you're in Kyoto now. You can see take, see a glimpse of a geisha sort of disappearing down a side alley. It's really quite remarkable. As I watch, I just remember, Rob, what you'd always said. You wanted everything veiled. You wanted to be seeing, like seeing through fabric. Mm -hmm. You wanted to create this mystery throughout, and it's just... The shot here, John, do you remember? It was the first yes. shot that we, it, that we shot in the movie. Yeah. Our first day of shooting. I see, did. right he, here, this is shot through, I don't know if you can see, it's through it's these series of beads, the sort of side shot there. And that's something that Dion Beebe and I worked very hard on to create a mysterious and exotic and sensual hidden world. And uh, wanted to give a sense that we were peering into this world. And so we constantly shot through fabric or bamboo or um, screens of some kind to give a sense of a hidden world. The actors here, um, Kori Momoi, who's one of the great actors of Japan, she plays mother. Here she's making her first time I actually see her face full. <laughs> um, she's an extraordinary actor who worked for Kurosawa. And um, people call her the Meryl Streep of Japan. And uh, I think you can see why sometimes, don't you, John? She has such range. She never sees to surprise me, take after take, and even watching the movie over and over, though it's in the can, I see a new, a new spark from her every time I watch. Very alive. And then also in this scene, Sai Chin, um, incredible actor who's done great movies, Joy Luck Club. You only live twice, John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was a Bond girl. And then Suzuka Ogo, who is our young Chio here, who was She's never spoken a word of English until she did this movie. She's, uh, she, she did a, a movie with Ken Watanabe in Japan, and that's how we found out about her. Francine Maisler, our casting director, and, and Yoko helped us find uh, her, and Ken was the one who really brought her to our attention. We saw a tape of her and fell in love. Fell in love, even though she couldn't speak English. She could. She did a little ballet dance. Remember? <laughs> yeah. I think what I think w one of the great challenges on this film, I'd say, was the language for everybody, because we had Japanese actors, Chinese actors, um, speaking everything from Mandarin to Cantonese to Japanese, and on the set. And so, um, I worked with interpreters to um, to speak to these actors and. Uh, Thank God we had the rehearsal we had, because if we didn't have that, um, that rehearsal time prior, I think it would have been a little more complicated on the set. I don't know if we would have gotten anything shot during the day. But um, I'll tell you, I, I, was, I was blown away by how these actors learned English. I mean, right here we, we have a Japanese girl, and then we have a young girl who lives up in Massachusetts, Zoe Weizenbaum, who's playing um, Young Pumpkin. And uh, they couldn't speak to each other, um, but they. But kids are great because kids find their way. They, mm -hmm. um, they, they had they had little sign language <laughs> that they did with each other. It's great. There's the water thing that we just see running through the kitchen there in that little yeah. moat there. The, you'll see the water imagery imagery throughout. We. Um, it starts with the. The fishing village, John, where we where we, be, where we began the water. Of course, we had so much more material, we right? We have a beautiful fishing village scene. That <laughs> yeah, sequence there that we had to let go because it's important to jump into. For for I think for me it was important yeah. to jump into this, into the story, and and 
and send us into this world. But the water you'll see, for instance, here, you'll see water throughout because it really represents her journey. Um, she is water. Um, it's that, um, it's one of the first things that's said by the narrator, and that is that even though um, water meets an obstacle, it finds a new path, and that really is her journey. I think she continues to move forward even when she faces adversity, and I think that's what separates her. It's the, it's the water in her, the blue in her eyes. Colleen Atwood was our costume designer on this movie, and uh, we were fortunate to have worked with her before in Chicago. In fact, we carried a lot of people from Chicago with us onto this movie. We, um, not only the costume designer, but also the production designer, John Meyer, and the cinematographer, Dion Beebe. Another example here, John, of shooting through fabric mm -hmm. and... The screens. Yeah. I felt that was really a, a wonderful, I don't know, comfort <laughs> for me to have people I'd worked with before, and it really gave me a sense of security, and we had this, we have sort of found a language, and, and uh, I think this was the challenge of a lifetime for all of us. I mean, everybody said it to me every day, didn't they, John? Yes. And it's also, they're also not only uniquely and sublimely gifted, but they're just great collaborators. They are, they're great collaborators. that's the way Rob works. Yeah. I like to, I like to involve people in decisions, but in, in, in everybody, you know, we, we, we talk about if, I, if I'm having a meeting about, for instance, Gong Li's kimono here, the sort of robe that she's wearing here, um, I want the cinematographer and the production designer and everyone to be aware of uh, the color we've chosen and why, and so try and involve everybody. I think it's maybe coming from theater. Gong Li was making her, or is making her English language debut in this movie as well. Or did these actors work hard on their English? Goodness. We had, um, during rehearsal, we had about seven rooms going at the same time. One room I'd be working on the scene work, and in another room, John would be doing the dance work. And then there was a room where there would be uh, dialect and language work, obviously. A couple rooms working on that. Um, we had uh, a room where Liza Dalby, our geisha expert, was teaching shamisen and how to move and walk and pour sake. Tea ceremony we were, was taught. Um, it was intense. It was intense. Mm -hmm. But I did feel, I have to say, I felt very... I guess honored is the is really the word to be working with these great actors, um, even though they were, you know, not speaking English. I, I really felt I I, I I felt like I had a great communication with them, because um, I think great great acting really transcends language. And their commitment was paramount. They had such immense respect for their characters True. and for the piece on the, as a whole. True. It's so interesting. The child here she has no idea what a geisha is. She's in this. She's. It's. You know. This is very Dickensian in a way, isn't it? Mm. Being taken from your family, sold into slavery. With. Um, with no sense of what your life will be, and. Uh, this, sh this is a great example of, 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 our, of the streets that we built. Especially this, um, this one of our bigger shots coming up here. This is, it begins here, this one shot. And uh, we crane up here. And you get a sense of the, our village. Which is actually in uh, north of Los Angeles in Ventura. <laughs> which is hard to imagine, but it was the only way we could control not only the period, which was the 20s and the 30s and the 40s when this is, is, takes place, pre-war Japan, post-war Japan, but also all four seasons, spring, summer, winter, and fall. Okay. 
this here, funnily enough, right here, that transition right there, we are now in out in San Francisco at Golden Gate Park. <laughs> <laughs> All our secrets are being revealed, John, I think. Mm -hmm. But it was so beautiful after coming back from Japan and having this world come to life, because we saw little pockets of it, as Rob said, mm. and then to see the whole town take shape as it would have looked. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting. We could never have done this without going to Japan. For instance, we went to the Sea of Japan, hoping to shoot there, and that was what helped us find the Sea of Japan, the opening sequence. We looked for, uh, Northern California was unbelievably similar in terms of terrain, in terms of the look. So that, um, that really, that, that was invaluable. I mean, you, obviously, the whole point of this movie is to take us to a different world. And then, of course, we were lucky enough to shoot in Japan. We, and you've seen examples of that already, the shots of the mountains. That's this dance I'm teacher in that last scene was Miyako Tachibana, oh, who yes. was my Japanese dance assistant. Yes. I also had an American, Denise Fay was also on board. Mm -hmm. But she, Miyako was invaluable in terms of keeping me on track yep, <laughs> and inspiring me. Yeah. Here we are in Granny's room. Mm -hmm. I think she's seeing what's interesting here for me, um, and it's one of the things that actually Gong Lee helped me with as we worked on this, and that is giving Hatsumomo a fully dimensional character so that she doesn't just become this evil geisha who's territorial. Um, she, she also, we see her with her lover, I mean, one of the most incredible things about the geisha world is that at this time, uh, you, geisha never married, and they had no choice in terms of love. They had no choice in terms of who they loved. So if there was a love of theirs, it had to be secret and hidden, and that's what Chio catches a glimpse of out the window. And I think ultimately it's, it's, it's that, that lack of being able to own your own heart that I think really destroys Hatsumomo ultimately. <laughs> I remember, I'm sorry, I was, I was just going to say I remember working on this scene, John, I'm sure you're going to say the same thing. I was. This scene was extraordinary in that both of these actors, neither of them speak English. So Gong Li is Chinese and Suzuka, who is Japanese, um, are speaking to me through interpreters, and I'm speaking to them through interpreters, and they can't speak to each other except in the scene in English. And um, But the truly remarkable thing was, as we continued filming, um, you know, it's always hard to make a day to, to finish your filming on time, and Rob's always trying to, get, trying to work as quickly as possible. He literally would, would forego the interpreters. He would understand. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. But I would, like, I would look, how did you know what she said? But he, there was some kind of communication it was deeper than the words, which mm. was beautiful. That's, uh, thank you, John. I, I think it was. It was. I, I think it's just because after a while you get to know actors and you know what they're feeling even before they tell you. And and certainly shorthand was something important. Also, um, charades helped a lot. <laughs> <laughs> This is Eugenia Yuan, wonderful actor, who um, plays her friend Corinne. Again, filming through the. Mm. This is also another moment for Chio to get a sense of how forbidden it is for um, someone to mention a boyfriend's name in this world. You notice there are no men in the Okias. It's all women. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, it really is extraordinary that, that it was an, a, a woman-run business even then. I mean, every single um, tea house owner and every Okia owner, uh, every mother, obviously, they were, it was all women-run. When we went to Kyoto, we were to do some research on the movie. It was fantastic. We brought the entire team. And... Um, we were entertained by Geisha at the Ishiriki Tea House, which is sort of the famous tea house 
uh, the tea house that takes the, where the novel takes place as well. And um, also we saw a young Michael got made up, didn't we, John, from mm. top to bottom. And there was an incredible moment, I'll never forget, when we were watching this Maiko, which means apprentice geisha, get made up. The mother of the Okia came in and was very nice to us and said hello in Japanese. And then she started screaming at this young geisha, young Maiko, in, uh, in Japanese, going, come on, let's go, you're, you're late, you're, you're late, you're late, late. you got to move it. And then you realize how how important time is for them because it's money. I remember looking at you. It was like, boy, something went off. It was like it still mm. exists. Yeah, and you see, you see. I mean, that's a big part of Mother's character, obviously. She's she's running the Sokia, and that's how they, they live off this one geisha. Everyone in that household lives off of Hatsumomo, but of course, as you see, she's the rebel geisha. And uh, although the most one of the most popular, most beautiful geisha, she really is sort of the one who is uh, <laughs> the one who doesn't really follow the rules. And you can imagine at this time how much more important it was to be a head geisha because those geisha were the trendsetters of their time. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons we took liberties with the look was because for me it was important to establish that that they were the supermodels of their time. It need to be we needed to be see them in a more glamorous way than a sort of a documentary, sort of authentic style. This is all a fable. I saw it as a fable. And um, I think that was very important. You know, we did an enormous amount of research for, I can't even tell you mm. how long, um, so we would know from where to depart. And we only departed, I mean, I only felt we needed to depart from the reality of this world in order to serve the story. And it's told through a child's eyes, and it was important, really, to see it that way. That was the one blessed freedom Rob gave all of the creative team, was he wanted us to do the research as if we were doing filming a documentary. But then, let it go and let your own artistic sense come in. That's all we can really do as artists, I think. It's your impression of the world. And uh, I certainly wasn't interested in doing a documentary of this fable. And... Uh, I think it gave everybody the chance then to bring their artistry to it. You're right, John. And we were religious in changing all the names of the towns and the tea houses. And mm -hmm. Yeah. This is not, not Kyoto, but Miyako. And this is the Hanamachi, not the Gion. Yeah. Another water image here. It, it, it was very helpful. I mean, transitions to me are very important in film. Um, because otherwise uh, you feel the stop and start of scenes and it's, it's important for me to sort of at least make the attempt at trying to find seamless ways of moving in and out of scenes so you don't feel that kind of, you know, the seams. Um, and uh, the water imagery really helped me uh, as, as, as the transitions were, were created. What you put this poor little girl through. <laughs> she was the trooper. I mean, I'll never forget. Suzuka was amazing. I mean, it, I, I think that the harshest part of this geisha's life is at the beginning of this story. And I would say to her things like, you know, today you're going to walk in rain and then you're going to, you know, fall off a roof and get whipped and learn that your parents have died. And, and she'd say to me, Okay. <laughs> because that's what you could say in English. Okay. But I'm telling you, I've never seen anything mm. like it. And still she, kept that smile on her face yeah. even though she wa was in the rain and got whipped. How many takes? Take Amazing. after take. Amazing. Extraordinary. Here she is in the running mm -hmm. in the rain, freezing cold. And, and um, just the, this, uh, it's, it's something that Sh Su Suzuka and Z shared was this in, uh, and is this incredible joy and spirit so matching that, and I also think they happen to resemble each other in, in, in many ways, but that wasn't what was important to me. What was important to me really was that the inside, the spirit, was something they shared, and it was incredible to, um, to find them. I really feel uh, unique in that way, right, John? Mm. 
We were lucky. We mm-hmm. did scour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Japan and the... Yeah. We went everywhere looking for these characters. Yeah. This is a portion of the set that we redressed, actually, to make it look like sort of the... the sort of more down part of... Uh, of, of uh, our, our village. Obviously, she's on the other side of the tracks here. It's very much like Amsterdam. Um, the Japanese prostitutes at that time used to sit in the window, as we just saw. You'll see another one coming up here. They just they sit in the window and uh, wait for customers there. What's interesting about Satsu here, obviously a 15-year-old who's sold into prostitution, is that you, it makes it seem as though Chiyo's life, even though she's, in, you know, in, uh, works as a slave in a geisha house, is so much better. If you see, for instance, instead of the full white geisha makeup, the prostitutes only wear their makeup on the neck um, so as to not smear because they have customer after customer. So you see it just goes up to the chin. And the obi is tied in front, if you can see that, where Chiyo's obi is tied in the back. It's tied in the front so it can be quickly um, loosened and unloosened. It's shocking when you think about a child of this age, John, being right. S- right. being sold into prostitution. And for people who don't know, the obi is that, that piece of fabric that goes around their waists. Thank you, John. When I think about the father at the beginning of this novel and beginning of this movie, um, making that decision, that unbelievable decision, though his wife is is dying and he doesn't have much of a choice, but I think he believed truly that both of his daughters would be would be in a, working in a geisha house. I don't think he had any, obviously, any idea that his one daughter would be sold into prostitution. I can't even fathom that choice. I mean, just, mm. I can't even really, it's well, hard for me to. I think it really was about no choice, really. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, as we talked about before, the only way a geisha can have her own love is to hide. I have to say, when I watch the scene, John, that Gong Li could possibly be one of the greatest actors I'll ever work with in my life. I remember when you... I was just just astonished filming this scene because of the amazing passion and depth and commitment, unbelievable, and not to mention the beauty. Thank God we had created a cast on for Chiyo so that when she was being whipped, she wasn't feeling it at all. Mm. That was very hard to make a child do. She was extraordinary once again. Take her arms. This next scene coming up was very difficult for mm-hmm. Lee, as we called her, Gong Lee. Yeah, and in China, Gong is the last name, Li is the first, so her name's really Li Gong, in our way of, of speaking. You are never to see him again. Huh? When Pietro, um, our wonderful editor, and I put this together, the scene together, we really worked hard to be able to stay on Gong Li as long as possible here, as you see, because she goes through so many emotions, from anger to humiliation to sadness. Of course, she sees the child who's ruined her, basically ruined her life. And Gong Li and I talked a lot about that, this, uh, this exact moment being the moment that really ch- changes her her view of, of, of Chio. 
He yeah. would give her notes through tears. She, we would stop filming, and then she would just weep. She'd let it all out, and then we'd go back and shoot it. Then she'd hold on to it again. Mm -hmm. She was remarkable. Mm -hmm. So obviously Chio's trapped here with uh, no place to go and, and desperate to meet her sister. This, this is what I love about this character, you know? Um, she doesn't, she, she tr tries to take destiny into her own hands even though she's told she can't. This is a sequence we storyboarded and it was much longer, much longer um, sequence on the roof. Um, this escape, and um, John, you choreographed this well, whole sequence. I remember sequence. working on this. I had a double before Susan, because you were using Susan in some scenes, and I had a double. And then she came onto the set. She just appeared, and she came up to me and asked me if she could do it. Mm -hmm. And she did everything. She did every bit of what you're seeing. Right. It was she was really she wanted to be up there. Yeah. And she falls. This is her falling and catching herself and everything. It's fun though for kids. I think it'd be fun. I'd <laughs> want to do it too. This is all built on a sound stage um, because obviously she can't be that high up with a child. So you have, and we didn't have to use any harnesses or anything like this. So this really is about, what would you say, John, about 20 feet up or yeah, something like that. Yeah. I have to bring up John Williams here for a moment, John, because oh. who, who did this incredible score. I was so lucky to have him and it was, I'll never forget sitting down with him at lunch at the commissary at Sony, and he said to me, um, I've never asked to do a film before, but I'd like to ask to do Memoirs of Acacia. And I think he really wanted to do something different and something challenging. And I was, I was in heaven from beginning to end with him. He is such a gentleman, so elegant, and such an artist. And um, he did something also that he said he rarely does. He, for this sequence right here, there were three different options, for and which I couldn't believe. Very different as well. Some more abstract than others. Um, he's in, he was um, thrilling to work with. Thrilling to work with. That that transition was something uh, that worked out earlier on <laughs> because uh, wanted to find a way to abruptly move into the scene and not actually see the landing of the fall, you know. Quite a dead. Huh? Shimono destroyed. Geisha school rice and pickles train ticket, Mr. Beck. All this on top of the money I paid Mr. Tanaka. I love that cigarette in there because uh, th this sort of explains Kaori, who, <laughs> who plays mother. Um, I remember uh, we were going to put tobacco in that little pipe because that's it's that's a sort of a period pipe from that time, and we started putting the tobacco. And she said, "Oh, that would take too much time for mother," so she just shoved the cigarette right in there. It just shows that she she only thinks from character, which is great. This was her audition scene. I remember she screen tested with this, and Rob and I watched it, and mm -hmm. we both said, "No, she's too young and too beautiful." Yeah, she was really she's a beauty. Mm -hmm. And then we just said, "Wait." And they then we watched, watched her, yeah. One over. Yeah. We have these funeral tablets. Yeah. That but, any Japanese watching would know. Yeah. Right now you know that the parents have died. Without, but for us, um, for the Western audience, we don't understand until we, we actually hear the words, but those are funeral tablets. There was so much that we learned. One of the joys of doing this piece was because we spent two years on this, you can enrich your life by learning so much about another culture. I've always been fascinated by Japan, but to be able to really sink ourselves, sink our lives into the world and immerse ourselves into this world, it was, it was an incredible and rewarding and difficult and ultimately amazing experience, really. And to see the cultures coming together as well on the set. Mm. The interactions and the, the joy and the laughter and the tears and the fears and the it, it was it was You know, our Pan Asian cast was very proud to be working with each other. 
I think that was incredibly exciting for them. And um, I know that they were in, in awe of each other. I felt that so palpably over at the Japanese opening, the mm. world premiere. Yeah, yeah. They were so proud that a quote-unquote Hollywood movie had been made without a huge, huge box office star. Right. I remember we were on the front of Time Asia, and they were the first sort of Pan-Asian cast, and it was very exciting. I should probably explain my philosophy about casting as we're about to meet the brilliant Ken Watanabe as the chairman. I, I, like I said before, they had worked together in a film, and they had played father and daughter. And um, that's how we found out about Suzuka. But Ken was such an obvious choice for this role. Um, I met him um, the day after the premiere of The Last Samurai in New York and went to his hotel room. And I'll never forget when he opened the door, I was really expecting to see kind of this imposing samurai tough guy. And what I met was this charming, elegant, lovely man who, to me, was the chairman immediately. He's so funny. And what I realized, and as we began talking, is that he'd never played a role close to, that was close to himself. And this, in many ways, was freeing for him, I think. He got to play something that was really closer to who he is. And... Uh, but in terms of casting, I think one thing I would say, John, and I know you know this, obviously, but just to share it with everybody, is that I really feel that it's a simple idea, and that is the best person for the role gets the, gets the role. And every one of these actors claim their roles, and that's the great hope as a director. You hope that they'll walk in and you'll meet them, and they'll say, this is mine. You know, when I think about this scene, such an important scene, because this small little meeting, this sort, this this accidental meeting, changes the course of her life. I think the, the uh, because I think for the first time, this child experiences an act of kindness in a very cruel world. Smile for me, won't you? <laughs> there now. That is your gift to me. This will buy your supper. Now promise me one thing. Next time you take a tumble, no frowns. <laughs> That's better. That smile. Yeah. I don't think, obviously, the chairman has any idea what he's done here. Um, he's just seen a sad girl that reminded him probably of his children. But he changes this young girl's life forever. It really is the thing that makes it uniquely a fable, isn't it, John? Mm -hmm. That something like that can change a child's life. Now we enter Japan, this incredible Fushimi Inari shrine in Kyoto, which is literally five kilometers of those orange Tori gates working their way up a hill. Absolutely exquisite. I remember you seeing and said, it's in the film. Yeah. <laughs> if we can get it, if we can secure the location. And it doesn't hurt to have Isak Perlman playing the violin here either. <laughs> John came up with this wonderful, John Williams came up with this wonderful concept, which was that the chairman would be represented by the violin and ultimately play, played by Isak Perlman. And Sayuri's voice throughout her theme would be played by the cello, which is uh, in our film played by Yo-Yo Ma. So we had two of the greatest soloists in the world playing um, the two main characters' themes. This was an incredible temple in, in Kyoto that we filmed. And um, to me, it's the end of Act One. The only reason we, we got permission to shoot at that temple, if you recall, John, is that the head I monk, remember. Her, the head monk uh, loved the movie Chicago, <laughs> <laughs> which I couldn't quite believe. Because we it, took it, though. It took an enormous amount of time to secure the rights to shoot in some of these places in Japan over a year. 
And uh, Patty Witcher, our executive producer, was tenacious. tenacious. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Good word for her. Exactly. Now we meet Yuki Kudo, who plays Pumpkin, older Pumpkin, and obviously Zi Zhang as Sayuri. Or Chiyo's still here, right, John? Hasn't become That's Sayuri. Right. I remember when uh, this cut with a chin <laughs> chilla collar came on to the set. People's mouths literally fell open. You know, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I look at Z here and I remember how many women we saw for this role, John. Extraordinary. Because the demands of this role were huge. She had to be here she plays 15. She had an age from 15 to 35. She had to be a great actor and a great beauty. She had to obviously speak English, and she had to become a, she had to be a great dancer, a brilliant dancer, because not only did she, does she dance in this movie, but she had to, in a very short amount of time, learn how to be a geisha, which actually takes a lifetime to learn. So she was, um, and everything, the way you tilt your head, the way you hold your purse, the way, you, mm -hmm. you know, Turn your feet, John, when you and, walk. And Everything is a dance. Yeah, and yeah. having that knowledge of the physical, really, really. I mean, here she doesn't have any of that. Right now, she's just the she's just the sort of the uh, the awkward teenager who hasn't had any lessons because for the past whatever years she's a slave. She's a slave, but then the transformation happens, and you start seeing the transition, and that would never have happened without a, a great dancer. We could never have taught that. It's interesting. We didn't hire any geisha, so to both our Japanese and Chinese actors, we had to teach them how to be geisha. We auditioned geisha. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't really act. <laughs> well, the language, the language really Yeah, the language varied. is prompt, too, yeah. And the role does demand such oh an gosh. emotional depth. Yeah. And she has to carry the picture. Mm-hmm. This, this was invented from... Uh, that was something that wasn't in the novel, her seeing him. But Robin Swicord um, and, and myself felt it was really important to see the older actor meet him before, because I, I, I think you don't really make that, I don't know, that connection unless you see this actor see him. So this, this, that, that little moment was something that was created. And you also, I remember you saying, you also wanted to keep the chairman alive, mm -hmm. which was, I think, that, that helps. Mm -hmm. Why is she here? Chia. Now we have the entrance. Well, we saw a glimpse of her before at the top of the stairs, but now we have the proper entrance of one of our favorite people, John Michelle Yeoh, as Mameha. Mm-hmm. A great leader for the company, I have to say, too. Mm -hmm. She had worked with Z before in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Uh, she never worked with Gong Li before, but knew her well. From out, I think kind of knew her from around um, cinema, obviously, and great, became great friends with Ken Watanabe and Corey Momoi. She just really is an extraordinary leader. Mm -hmm. And I think to know her is to just... Warm to her. <laughs> yeah, immediately. Well, she's forever. very much like Mameha, I think. Yes, she is. She's wise and elegant and kind. I can always trust you to be successful. With your eye for beauty and nose. What's interesting about this scene uh, is that what's being said is not really what's what it, the scene's about. <laughs> it's all these little formalities. It's very Japanese in a way, because it's all, you know, the Jap. The Japanese have this incredible formality to their language and to their way, where ultimately, when I've dealt with them, and I know many people feel this way, that they rarely say no. 
but even when they mean no. So you have to learn. It's very gracious, actually, I have to say. But that's very much what the scene is about. It's really, that. see this little move of the teacup is very much like a chess move. And that's really what this scene is. It's a little chess game between these two very strong women. If Chio hasn't repaid her debt within six months after her debut... Not impossible! Too little time! Then I will pay you twice over. Why? No geisha could ever... This is very much a sort of a Pygmalion kind of thing when you say John hmm. um, Shaw. It's Dickensian in a way, too. The woman that comes to be the mentor to the young apprentice. In a mysterious way. In a mysterious way, exactly. She isn't in it for the money. That much is for certain. Rumor has it. Ever since the prime minister bought her Mizuage, she's been rich. Mizuage? That's so? I remember when I read the novel Mizuage, to me, maybe it's because... I know French or something. It was misouage or something to yeah, me. I, I it was incredible learning all of this. And um, it was really helpful. Jessica Drake was our dialect coach on this. And uh, remember, John, we, we, we all learned, of course, all of the exact pronunciations of everything. But um, uh, she was very helpful. And I remember giving us lists of things and how they're said and, you mm -hmm. know, and, and uh, obviously trying to coordinate all these different actors. I mean, we have um, two Chinese actors here and a Japanese actor here, and and it's in, uh, both Lee and Z are speaking English for the first time in the film. And Yuki Kudo is pumpkin, actually lives in Los Angeles, and speaks English beautifully. So she actually had to bring some of her Japanese accent back into her language as the other actors were, were learning to uh, reduce their accents. This tiny world of women, friend turned against friend. And now the two greatest geisha in Miyako are at war over me. Hatsumoma at my back. Mameha calling. Offering me the chance to become one of those. This is a, once again uh, our Hanamachi, John Meyer built. And uh, obviously example of, um, of having to do it in another completely different season. Here we are in winter. This is Kari Tagawa who plays the Baron. Mame has Donna. Mame has Donna. And remember, John, he was in uh, The Last Emperor. He wrote in The Last oh, Emperor. That's right. Yeah. Yes. And he was uh, thrilled to be working on this movie. I remember how happy he was. And again, as Michelle just said, this Donna is their patron. Mm -hmm. Well, I think here we begin to learn really what a geisha is. I don't think it's really clear that. Um, a geisha studies the way she does until we begin this whole sequence. Mm. And do they study? Yeah. Every geisha I would come upon, I would ask about their lives, and the first thing everyone said was, I have no time. Hmm. They work, they dance all day and study the shamisen and mm -hmm. entertain at night and then sleep four hours and get up the next morning. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Go back to study two days off a month. Well, they're about to, you know, Michelle's actually about to say that they are moving works of art, which is really what they are. Everything about everything about it, them is a performance, you know. Um, they are they are there to entertain as performers. Hatsumomo cannot tolerate competition. She is jealous of you. Not me, I'm afraid. Someone closer to home. Rise. It's, she's so naive, ultimately, isn't she, John, mm. that she's not aware that Hatsumomo's jealous, actually, of her. How could she be jealous? How could this great geisha be jealous of this young girl? What she doesn't see is because she has no self-esteem at all. She feels worthless. She has no idea how special she is, how beautiful she is. And clever. Yeah. yeah. Part of becoming a great geisha is being able to not only entertain the men, but also have great repartee and mm -hmm. know what's going on in current events and they yeah. read the papers you have a gift for expression. And, and know all that's going on. Mm -hmm. It's very, it, it, it really is, John, it's an extraordinary profession in that it's unbelievably competitive and you have to, I mean, especially at this time, 
um, this was sort of the heyday of the heyday of the geisha, and I would say that they really had to, I mean, without question, um, be at top of their form. There were so many geisha to survive. Like I said before, the geisha were the ones that were the breadwinners for each each house. And I don't think people realize either that a geisha could go to 10 or 12 tea houses in a night. That would be that would be uh, a normal night of, of, of work. This was exciting to create the sequence because two things are happening at once. Obviously, as we progress through the montage of her becoming a geisha, we also see at the same time she's preparing for her debut. And so you were going back and forth between the two. And this was, this felt actually in, in, in a funny way, very much like a musical number. Um, as we created this, didn't it, John? Mm. Because it was all about transitions. It, it felt like uh, a piece. And in an odd way, this is the centerpiece of the movie. We had, um, you know, it's all, all, always very tricky in film because you have to condense material. And so in a short amount of time here, we had to show all the different things that ha she had to do to become a geisha. And it's, um, she has a very short amount of time to become one. But the fact that she's a natural is something that is uh, that helps her, obviously. Here, uh, for instance, having to play the shamisen after putting her hands in ice, so that the idea is that when you're nervous and you have to play the shamisen uh, you're, and you're, you feel like your fingers freeze, you'll have been able to master the feeling of that and be able to play through that. This is a shot of our dog, right Gilly. Right behind the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Here she is. She but was the on the set every the, day. Yeah, she was on the set every day. But the transitions, for instance, of falling into that rice, John, coming mm -hmm. out of that into the powder of the of the uh, the powder box there. It does all move like a dance. Mm -hmm. And this, we were lucky also, we wanted to find a mameha that had knowledge of dance. It had to, because... She had to be the teacher, obviously, so she had to be a brilliant dancer as well. And Michelle studied in London at the Royal School of Ballet. And really did beautiful in our geisha classes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, she's, she, she's, 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 I mean, many people know her from her martial arts work and so forth, but she's an unbelievably physical person and a great dancer and learned so much about becoming a geisha very quickly and knew that she had to do that to become to play Mameha and really be the teacher. Well, dancers also, the discipline is is crucial mm -hmm. in a dancer's life. They're disciplined to a fault. And with that, you understand the discipline of a geisha. True. I mean, so many interesting details. Um, obviously, painting your eyebrow with charcoal. I mean, that you literally have just you know, blown out and extraordinary. And here is comes, this is the wax that is put through their hair, which it's it's odd combination of beauty and cruelty and the harshness of their life, what they have to go through to become this incredible thing that is a geisha, which is almost impossible to really explain ultimately what it is. I think that's what the movie is in some ways, trying to explain what that is. And they're lush pillows. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's the idea. Obviously, is that you can't fall off the pillow um, to ruin your hair. So the rice is put there, and now she obviously has to go back to the <laughs> the beauty parlor and have it done again. It's just um, part of the training. And I can't imagine. I'm sorry. I can't even imagine um, sleeping on a pillow like that. Along with you were saying, John. Along with that. Um torture of that hot wax and the, the hairdo come, comes this bald spot mm -hmm. that uh, the geishas have at the top the crown of their heads. Yeah, it's a really sign of achievement. Yeah, they're proud of it. Mm -hmm. And all the many, many layers of the mm -hmm. kimono Extraordinary are. how many layers there are. I, I remember um, we would have the actors, we'd call the actors and, and I'd find out, oh well, 
you know, someone's in, 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 in wardrobe and they're dressing. And I would, at the beginning of the process, I thought, oh, well, they'll be on the set in about 15, 20 minutes. And it was an hour later because it literally took an hour, sometimes an hour and a half to, to just put on the kimono because it's layer after layer after layer. And so ends the sequence, our montage, and we, the idea obviously is that uh, everything that she's been preparing for in those little snippets is, is, is this, is, is this her debut as a Maiko. And her test. Mm -hmm. I remember when we were at the tea house that one night, Rob, mm -hmm. they, gave, they gave you, being in the seat of authority that evening, mm. the young Michael met her debut. Do you remember? Yes, and she yes. spilled your. Yes, she was mortified. Of course, I was like, "That's fine with me." I. You know, but... The first thing she did was spear his beer and sake all over, yeah. and was mortified. She was mortified. You are not making my but you see just how even Z is holding her hands there, how she's holding her head, how she's turned in, and that wonderful spray of sparks over her shoulder by Auntie, which is for luck, that and depends. then having to walk in these. Incredibly difficult shoes. I remember we did that as actually as all as one shot. We cut into that, but we actually did that whole long shot as one long crane. Was it a crane shot, John? Or was it a dolly shot? Actually, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Both, dolly. both, yeah. This is our sister's ceremony. Mm -hmm. Once again, shooting through. It's actually through a wall, a cutout in a wall, stone wall. I felt little chill disappear behind your white mask with red lips. You know, when I think about this movie, John, I also, you know, think very much about um, our producers, Doug Wick and Lucy Fisher, and and how incredibly supportive they were. They worked incredibly hard to get this to the screen. Um, Steven Spielberg, who came along as producer as well for us was um, you know it was how many years in the making I mean Stephen at one point Seven. was going to be directing this movie and it was um, they held on to this because they believed so much in this I think the universality of the story um, and the triumph of the human spirit ultimately I think was very important to them and I was uh, we were very lucky to be working with them as we shaped this from beginning to end they were very end. helpful in terms of script mm -hmm. and and we're there for every step of the way. Every step of the way. We have the pleasure to witness the debut They're great collaborators and great friends. This is, a, this is very much, um, looks like the Ishiriki Tea House in Kyoto. Very similar. It's actually based exactly on the room that we were entertained in. And it's, um, it's all about this. It's you come to the tea house. This is where you perform. You are now on stage. And everything you do, as you see here, how she bows, how she is about to pour the tea here as she pulls her sleeve back and she reveals her wrist, which is a sign of sensuality. Seduction. Seduction. <laughs> this was reminiscent of what you were just talking about, the Maiko that and during the beginning, during her debut, she, she, <laughs> she fails. Welcome to Miss Marin. It is her very first time. So John, this is your yes, incredibly difficult fan dance. How did how which did we have cut down for for yeah to keep the story rolling along? It's as part of it. I know. It always is tricky. Well, it was the same in Chicago. You mm -hmm. know, as Robbie always said, he was a director and choreographer, and the director would always win. You have how to keep the story moving, and but Although, she did a beautiful job on this. The detail. Yeah. I don't think it's. It, you know, it, in some ways it looks simple and effortless, but it's so difficult, isn't it, John? Very difficult. Because it, it, it's so exact. I mean, John, because you were a Bob Fosse dancer, I think that sort of isolation and, and attention to detail is something that comes mm. more easily to you. Well, like any dancer, and just the eye for detail. It's such a different form, because mm -hmm. ballet and jazz the American state is so up in the air and out of the ground, mm. and this, this dancing is in the floor with pigeon-toed and... Mm -hmm. The ballet's pointed feet and extension out. And how long did Gong Li work uh, on this fan? A thousand trick? times a day. She would do it. A million times. Her name is Sayuri. 
there were actually three tricks in there, and I said, choose one, and then she said, I'm doing them all. And then I didn't <laughs> want her to, but Rob said, let her do them. Well, she needed to upstage uh, Sayuri. She here. Ling Kwai, you did such an incredible um, hairdo for Hatsumomo here, and that little loose part that she l shows that she's really the rebel geisha, because that's something a geisha wouldn't do. There's so much I would like to say to Hatsumomo. Sometimes the smartest remark is silence. What better advice to follow? Than Even how they pour that sake, John, is all—it's all, it's all uh, very, very specific, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes. Of course, but. It's been such a very long, long... It's so interesting, because I think long, it really is um, a misconception as to what a geisha is in the Western culture. I mean, certainly I believe they were glorified prostitutes. I had no sense that uh, they, the word geisha means artist. She can destroy me. She will spread rumors. And we realize their commitment to their arts mm -hmm. was comparable to a New York City ballet dancer. Very much so. Now, of course, a geisha, uh, you make a choice as a teenager, a 16-year-old. You don't start early now. At age 16, you make a choice uh, that you want to become a geisha like you want, like, like you would want to become a ballet dancer or a model. Um, and they, I think they do it now really just to, to study the traditional arts. We may find Nobu quite the challenge. He does not like geisha. This was an incredible set that John Meyer built on a soundstage at Sony, if you can believe it. Um, obviously, because we, we were recreating the sumo matches of the 30s. And one of the joys of this was, this is so authentic, everything about it. Um, we had incredible sumo uh, fighters, uh, wrestlers with us. That was, it was really an honor another, to have them. Another Herculean effort by our executive producer, Patty Witcher. Yes. I said, I'd like to have uh, some Japanese sumo wrestlers for the sequence, real ones. And she said, well, that's impossible. You, you can't do that. And I said, and, and uh, well, she, I, actually, she didn't say you can't do that. She said, I think that's impossible, Rob. And I said, well, let's see if we can do it. And of course, she delivered incredibly. Here, they're introducing the, the fighters in the ring. We are harnessing the power of water to bring electricity to some of the smaller villages. It was in the news. I like very, very much that this whole sequence is very masculine because we're introducing here Koji Yakusho, who plays Nobu, uh, one of the great actors of Japan, who um, I think many know from the Japanese Shall We Dance. Somebody said to me early on, because I was just learning about these actors, had seen some of their work, had seen that, but had, didn't really know extensively their work. and. Francie Maisler said, oh, well, he really is the Al Pacino of Japan, you know, so you really get a sense of who they are um, by comparing them to actors we know. He really fought for this part. We saw him in Japan, and his English just wasn't up to it. Mm. And he kept working and working, came to L.A. and auditioned again and again and, and won it. These are two very well-known wrestlers. Um, these are the ones we had, and the, and the referee is a national treasure in Japan. We went to a, um, um, the whole team, uh, when we took our big trip to Kyoto at the beginning of this whole process, um, we actually went to Osaka and uh, saw a sumo match. And it was great because we had the producers with us, we had the writer, we had the, all the designers, Dion Beebe, the cinematographer. And, uh, I can't imagine doing it any other way. We had to really experience it together. And, 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 and I think we were all blown away by the beauty uh, and, uh, of the world. It was, um, it was incredibly exciting to do that kind of research and really dig in to see if we could find what it was really like in the 30s. And they really opened their arms to us. They, we were taken around and given a red carpet treatment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Only compared to his opponent. Miyagiyama may use Hatakikomi. This is a sequence that we actually found with Pietro, which was very exciting, Pietro, our editor. We needed to really underscore the fact that, obviously, Sayuri is seeing the chairman really for the first time as an adult. And, um, and, and we worked at sort of changing the sound here um, with our great mixers and 
Wiley Stateman, our des sound designer, it was it was uh, something that was a sort of a group effort when you say, John. Mm. All I can think of is that wonderful sumo rest, the smaller sumo wrestler. Yeah. And what he went through to, <laughs> to make himself taller. I know. He was too, t he's too t he was too tiny to be one, so he actually had something implanted in the top of his head. He, they're both retired now, both of these um, wrestlers. They just recently retired, but they're very famous. I see now why you like sumo. You can never judge a man's power by his appearance alone. You see she has the, the red underneath collar there, John. That's the, yes. that's the sign of a maiko. And when you become a full geisha, you, it's changed to white. Turning the collar. Turning the collar. chose to use Japanese um, as a sort of a, a flavor throughout the film. So uh, because, uh, once again, this is being translated to us by this, as you hear, as you, as you hear by the, um, the storyteller, by the narrator, Sayori. And so I felt there were things, there were places where we didn't need to understand. We just needed to get the sense of the flavor. So you, we, you hear Japanese. A lot of the sort of background is, is all in Japanese. It's part of the reason we loved using the accents and letting those accents become, you know, stay the way they were. The mm -hmm. Japanese people had very thick accents, and I do feel as I'm watching it, I'm, I'm watching another world. It helps me. I think you've always felt that, Rob. That yeah, I mean, I think I've always... One of the great things film can do is take you to another world. I'm certainly... It's something that one of my heroes, David Lean, was able to do so brilliantly. It was really immerse you into a completely different world whether it be Russia or India, Ireland, you know, and, and really feel like you are a part of that world and you're seeing all the odd intricacies of the life and um, the rituals as you see. What? Oh, I will do it for you. Ha have you gone mad? Do you trust me or don't you? Well... This is um, this was a fun scene to film for Z, who's very funny, and she never gets a chance really in the film to show much humor. But obviously, the great thing about Z is we'd be doing very emotional scenes, and it would be over, and she would just you know, she she would come to life again, John, and just you remember she's just, not precious with it. Her no, she, no, she, she 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 she's just loves life, and she's just she's just infectious to be around. I really feel that an actor like Z comes along once in a generation. All the combination of all those things in one person. This is our Dr. Crab. Yep, yeah, Randall Duck Kim. Very prominent New York actor. Mm -hmm. New York stage actor. Yeah. He read for every role in this movie. I think he did. <laughs> And the great thing about him as Dr. Crabbe for me was that um, it's kind of a loathsome character on the page. And I, I, you know, even the, the sort of the characters that are creepy or odd, you, you still want to f understand them and feel them and make them human. And he was able to do that. You like them, even if they're strange and odd. Mm. And only she knew the rules. Ekubo, at the right moment, Slip it to Nobu, discreetly. Beautiful door of Mount Fuji there, John. I didn't mm. really get to show that much of John. Yeah. John Meyer had all these incredible sets and pieces sent from Japan so that we could use. And a uh, perfect example is in this scene, there are two tea houses, uh, re tea house restaurants that are connected to each other. And um, we call them the veranda restaurants. And if if you look carefully, the one that Hatsumomo's on is sort of made of, almost looks like thorns. And Sayuri's r restaurant, where she is, is all water design in wood. It's just a, something as, as subtle as that. John Meyer, uh, you know, worked from the story to create these, these sets. It is a trinket. I found it a few days ago. I remember one of the tricky things about this, John, if you if you recall, because at night time, for whatever reason, it was freezing where we were shooting. And so 
we were always concerned about the uh, breath coming out, have you know, with um, what's that called, John? Fog, smoke. <laughs> you know, you could see their breath, and so a lot of times they had to actually suck ice before the scene started, <laughs> so there wouldn't be so Chewing much breath. It know. helps. It does help. It doesn't. Such a joyous moment, Sayori. You're finally getting what you deserve. How oh, lovely. <laughs> this is a, a crucial scene for the chairman, obviously, because if he sees um, Nobu's interest in Sayuri clearly, and it's 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 you know he saw, he saw it at the sumo match, obviously, but here he sees it actually really take on a whole nother a whole nother form and I think he realizes that he has to step away which is of course his great tragedy and it's something we don't learn about till the end of the movie but it's it's um I mean one of the tricky things about this movie is that you're seeing it all from her perspective so the we we don't learn much about what the, what the chairman's going through we have little glimpses of it throughout and that was one of the challenges of editing to be quite honest was how much of the chairman's heartbreak can we see without giving away everything at the end so we realize obviously that he's loved her all along but that moment for him I mean Ken was extraordinary that way because I would have to say to him you have to we have to see what you're feeling but not in, in such a manner that you're indicating what you're feeling I mean it was it's a really fine line for him to tread and uh, it was not not easy to do but um, it, it was a, a real balancing act we call this Mizuagi, and to become a full geisha, we must sell it to the highest bidder. This is a tunnel we used th three or four times in the movie, right, John? Mm. Because they're all over um, uh, Kyoto, and um, and they're wonderful. They really give a sense of that maze-like world of, of, of the geisha, of the Hanamachi, which means entertainment district. And we would just redress them. Yeah, redress them with uh, different fa uh, different woods, different siding, all imported from Japan. Mm -hmm. Here you hear John Williams' water music again, John, that mm. it feels like churning as, as her story continues to unfold. That was something that, uh, that John found for us, was this, this water theme. When I see this scene, I think of Dion Beebe because I think it's extraordinarily lit. I mean, I, I, what, he, what, he was, what he's able to do with light, with moonlight here on these white faces, you know? And um, it's, it's, an, it's amazing to think that both of these characters as well are only 15. And they really are pawns in this, this game. And they have no control of their life, uh, which is something that ultimately Sayuri resists that she has to have the control. Um, she has to be able to have a voice in her destiny. Of course not. Is Mame Hassan cruel to you too? No. She's so kind to me. But sometimes I worry she's taking me further from the things I want. I think it's an important line, isn't it, John? Mm. Um, because the only reason she has any interest in becoming a geisha really is to reach this man because it's the one thing it's the one hope that she has she holds onto that handkerchief um, it represents hope in a very hopeless world <laughs> don't worry about me to john i'll be fine betas are fine mother plans to adopt me so my dream about poor pumpkin <laughs> Yeah, it's hard. There, there are no. It's very, I'm sure, very hard to find friends in this world. And the one poor person you should be close to is your older sister. Mm -hmm. Her older sister happens to be Hatsumomo. Yeah. You could still so she's out there alone. Mm-hmm. Another water transition, John. Mm -hmm. it takes us into the scene. This is also in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, John, if you recall. I do. 
this scene, I remember this happens sometimes. You carry a scene because it's a short scene or whatever, or you didn't make your day. That scene was carried, and we we were gonna we were gonna shoot that in a million different places. Mm -hmm. One, I remember one was the beauty shop. Yeah. I forget the number, but I bet Patty Witcher remembers the number of that scene because it was on the call sheet every day. I don't know if you recall, John, I was concerned about ripping down this poster because I thought it would might be a little too similar to Chicago <laughs> when Catherine Zeta-Jones rips down mm -hmm. the poster at the beginning of the movie. and and uh, But that's a silly concern, mm -hmm. and it made such sense for the movie. It's interesting, though. It's it's someone else, you know. She was ripping. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> know, it's show business is well, ripping. Well, I mean, that's the ir irony about all this. One of the reasons I really wanted to do this film, following Chicago, was to do something completely different and and do something dramatic and 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 really stretch myself and try something that was new. And um, and of course, that's very much what this was. But. Um, someone said to me, you know, you do realize that this is, a, you're still doing a, uh, there's this is still a story of women rivals in show business. <laughs> so I guess there's, a, <laughs> there's something, uh, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me, but um, something similar there, obviously. For, this is the first scene we shot with Z and with uh, Michelle backstage. But just it's just a wonderful backstage, don't you think, John? Because <laughs> because they're kneeling. It's, it was so so different than shooting a normal backstage, obviously. This was an incredible theater that we found in Los Angeles that we completely gutted and created. I mean, all the, the, whole, uh, the audience are on their knees. Um, they're all on pillows on their knees. And... Uh, And this, of course, is the Spring Dances, John, which you mm -hmm. did an enormous amount of work on. Remember, we, we, we struggled for the look of this, and, and when we decided to create a cherry blossom curtain, that was, uh, that was something that really set us free, because we, we didn't want, we wanted to invent this and um, make this slightly more, more modern in a way. So why don't you tell us the story, John, of this dance that you created here? Well, it, it started from, I made a dance DVD, and one of the images that everyone fell in love with was the, with these eight-inch black lacquered shoes. And so I took it, and, and what I found out was that these courtesans wear them in these processionals. So I made her a courtesan, and she has been spurned by her patron. And flips out, goes crazy, and uh, goes out in the snow and goes and is off to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Suicide being a huge theme in their, in their dances. So this is actually in some ways Kabuki inspired, is that right, John? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the story is she knows this woman as well as she knows Sayuri Z. You know, she knows every movement means something. And mm -hmm. this poor woman who is, will be, you know, all her earthly possessions now will be ripped from her. Mm -hmm. um, Colleen, our costume designer, worked very hard. I wanted this robe to be ripped off in the middle, and I didn't want to cut away. And she worked and worked and worked and worked and, and finally figured it out. But the idea of this lonely figure in the snow, what's interesting about all of this and sort of the madness that she goes through and the fact that she ultimately is on her way to commit suicide, I think the reason that really struck a chord for both of us was the fact that it really in some ways mirrors the frustration of what she's going through in 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 the real story and the fact that she has no voice and can't speak and and the emotion behind having to hold on to her to to all her secrets and not being able to love who she wants to love all that frustration i think is why sayuri succeeds so brilliantly in this dance exactly i would have long discussions with her about that once that curtain opened she didn't even realize in rehearsals um of her own rehearsing this this dance in the film of course how much emotion she would have when she mm -hmm. went out in front of these people because and how she, much it correlate how much how deeper mm -hmm. she would go because she's dancing for the chairman 
I mean, everything she says early on, she says, everything I will do now, from now on, will be for the chairman. And the fact that he's there and she sees him there in the audience, um, I think she realizes this is her chance to be seen. She's waiting for him to claim her. John, you introduced me to these incredible yes. streamers. This I love them. This is part of my dance video as well. These incredible Japanese. They use them as spiders in the on stage. And, mm -hmm. and they're, they're really kabuki streamers. And we sent away for them. And, and we thought, what a wonderful way for her to enter the party. Of course, we call it the opening night party. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, um, this was actually filmed at Yamashiro Restaurant in Los Angeles. We took it over, and it became so many things for our film. And... Um, it sits at high atop Los Angeles. Now everybody knows our secrets, John. It's I all. Know. <laughs> it's all out. But you know, the great thing was be able was being able to combine these this location work with what we built and with our 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 our, um, our work in Japan. One of our players, John, who actually played in our actual orchestra for yes. John Williams. Don't you think? Indeed. Omer, did you invite the chairman to my estate this weekend? Is my annual blog what are the name of those discs, John? Those red discs. Uh, Sonangasa. Sonangasa, and that's uh, that, that's a traditional Japanese dance that the woman's doing behind there, right? In the background. Yeah. There's not much vocabulary in that dance, but mm. <laughs> she's doing all of it. That's great. <laughs> she's right there behind. Well, I love there. how the the hat sort of is a Becomes disc as part well. Of the, yes, yeah, it, it is, comes it part is. of the design of the dance. No, their props are just stunning. Mm. The magic they do with very simple, simple props. I think that's what we learned a lot about, which is the fact that simplicity in the design, the simplicity um, in their performance is, 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 I mean, is what it's all about, the subtlety. And the care they give everything. It's mm -hmm. funny because when I go there, you always stay the same person no matter where you go or what you do, but you do. There are different aspects that come into your being. I, I place dishes down differently mm -hmm. and I'm aware of different things yeah. when I'm in Japan. This is Japan right here. This is actually the first shot that we shot in Japan. It's uh, a bamboo forest um, just outside Kyoto. And uh, we, had, we didn't have to do very much to it. Yeah. It's right there. Her first trip in a car. That was some car. Mm hmm. Beautiful. Maybach. And here we are going to see the $100,000 cherry tree. <laughs> right there. Yeah. It was interesting. Uh, you know, um, we built that tree. Um, John Meyer built that tree limb by limb and uh, blossom by blossom. And, uh, you know, it really is very much like um, this incredible tree in Miriyuma Park in Kyoto, which is people come from all over, all over the world to, to see this tree at, at uh, cherry blossom time. And so we, we decided to build this, this grand party around the viewing of that one tree. I'd like to to thank you for your attention to Nobusan. This is one of the rare scenes between the two of them. It was very difficult, actually, sort of building a story, a quote-unquote love story, um, uh, around characters that don't meet and talk much. Um, it's it's a it's it's a it's a very unique love story in that way. They love from afar, and it's not until the very end where they're able to be truthful. Um, I don't think people really understand, ultimately, uh, how important in Japanese culture it is to respect another man's wishes, especially a friend. In, 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 in our movie here, obviously, Nobu has um, given his life, ultimately, for the chairman and, and became scarred because of it. Um, and so the chairman owes him this incredible debt. So much so, um, he feels such uh, sort of, uh, uh, he owes him such a debt that he can't step into the way of his love for this young woman who is, is his, is the chairman's love. So it's, um, it's extraordinary when you think about that, John, don't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is that, that he, he holds that above his own heart. There you are. I have a present for you. 
but that's sort of w one of the very few intimate moments they have. Let me show you my kimono collection. It's quite venerated. My grandfather and father collected kimono before me. I've given a number of valuable kimono to Mamea. I like to give presents to beautiful girls. The idea behind the design of this um, kimono room was really a cage where she's caught. And um, once again, John helped Dion and myself create the sense of a, a, different, a different world, different space, peering in through the fabric here. And uh, this is a real, really a museum quality um, kimono that he's giving her as a gift. It's one of the sort of more extraordinary kimono in the movie. There, I can't even, there were thousands of <laughs> kimono in the movie, but this one was, um, is very rare. The detail is extraordinary. Don't worry. I interviewed Z at this uh, function and asked her what the most difficult scene for the movie for what was for her, and she had said this scene. Mm -hmm. Because she's in a position where she can't really fight um, because of the position she's in, which is, is un, doesn't make a lot of sense for a modern woman. So to place yourself in that kind of helpless position was so painful for her. Um, and I remember we made a very conscious choice to show the layers of kimono as he takes them off of her instead of every single one when she's dressing for her debut. It, it, we were looking for a place to show the different layers and how much there was involved and how much binding there was and so forth and it was during the sequence we thought let's show it actually when it's coming off and um as she clutches the handkerchief mm -hmm. of the chairman yeah we decided to shoot it in these mirrors these incredibly antique mirrors to really give a sense of um her humiliation Right, it's not only happening to her, but she's seeing it reflected back. She's her. seeing herself, exactly. on the wind. So careless. Dion and I decided to shoot this um, whole sequence behind this uh, glass. Um, it was real. I, I really felt in many ways this was a kabuki play, this sequence, that where, where they um, confront each other. And I also wanted to give a sense of isolation, a her uh, isolation at the end when she's alone. Not worthless. That was a main trick. <laughs> well, we didn't tell uh, Z that Michelle would say her final line and exit with such fury. And um, I, we kept the camera rolling, and uh, Z just broke. I don't like to do that normally. I mean, I think actors can really summon the emotion without having to play a trick. But I, I just, we just felt that she needed to feel that great sense of um, despair and that she's alone. And she's the only woman that's given her anything in terms of friendship. To, yeah. So to turn, have her turn her back on her was when she was wrong too. I mean, right. Exactly. So it was something we just thought we'd try. And uh, Z, Z knows. I mean, I, I, it's very important for me to take care of my actors. I really feel that they have to feel comfortable, they have to feel safe so that they can actually try things and not be afraid of failure and being be able to try anything without having to feel like they're being judged. 
So I don't like to do that normally, but I, I think it's something we tried. It goes to this Okia, all the 15,000 yen, to this estate. I do not understand. That's even where they inherit as my adopted daughter. What? Adoption is such an important part of the Okia because it really means that you have a future and that you have uh, security for your life um, because when you become adopted, you also inherit the Okia. And Pumpkin's great fear, knowing that she's not a natural geisha, is that she will have no place to live out her life. And so she's, I think she, right here she sees the writing on the wall that this will not be her Okia, that she has no further life here, that she will not become a successful geisha, and that the only choice for her probably at this point would be prostitution. Who paid for the show on your back, the rest in your bowl? Gong Li and I sat and talked about this scene. This was really something that Lee felt was necessary. She said it wasn't in the original script. She, f she really felt it was important that she and mother go head to head so that all the pretense is dropped. Like a geisha. Like a common prostitute. Because the downward spiral has begun. But Sayuri? And the shift of power has uh, started here, obviously. She can burn a camera with her look so unbelievably powerfully. It's extraordinary. I mean, uh, Gong Li is really a force. We will see. Well, the depth of feeling. I remember her after her, her last night of filming, how you took her by the hand and walked through this Okia, and she just wept. You both didn't speak, and she just wept. She asked, she asked to, to, to walk each room and to remember what had happened in each room. And, and right, we didn't speak, but we just walked from room to room. And she, she loved this character, and it was very hard for her to let it go. Everything we wanted, you made it happen. This is once again in our Hanamachi that we built. And we actually did something because the final line in this scene is, tonight the lights in the Hanamachi all burn for you. That's what Mameha says to Sayuri. So because of that, we added m more red lanterns than we normally would have. We wanted it to be filled with red lanterns uh, to really give a sense that this is, this is Sayuri's moment. And what's interesting is, she has won, basically. She's become the great geisha, and her Mizuwage has been sold. Her virginity has been sold for the highest amount ever. But it's such an empty, an empty win, because she's lost everyone around her. And all she really wants, ultimately, is to reach the, the man that she loves. I remember the scene with Michelle was interesting, because when we first shot it, she just wept during the scene. And then I took her aside and spoke to her. I, I said, I'm so glad you feel that and that you have that emotion. Now hold back <laughs> and don't let us see any of that, which was something that was, she understood because it's the role of Mameha would never show that. She'd only, she deeply, deeply hide it underneath. And uh, I give her a lot of credit for taking that direction and having that restraint, because while everybody's that. crying and mm -hmm. throwing things, she holds on. Yeah, she did, and I think it's what makes that scene powerful, is that she's able to still feel um, guilty for putting Sayuri in that position. Even though she, her heart is breaking, because she's lost the Baron. This scene um, obviously is when she gives up her virginity, which if you can possibly imagine is sold. Of course, this no longer happens. And uh, I think it was one of the most controversial things about the novel 
and one of the reasons why some of the older establishment in Kyoto, for instance, um, weren't pleased and, and, and didn't like the novel and don't like the story because it, it seems to, you know, explore this idea of, of the selling of, of virginity. And obviously it happens no longer, but it did happen then. This was Kaori's final scene in the movie, I remember, her final shot. And I thought it was appropriate that it was her final shot in the film because she's, she's able to show a more human side to the character now that uh, Sayuri is a full geisha. Finally become a woman, you see in her face the, um, the emotion. What are you doing in my room? This is something that was completely invented, something I found we needed to do. This is the perfect example of how you have to take a novel and turn it into a film. You, you can't sometimes do something, which the novel does very well, of slowly unraveling a character like Hatsumomo until she kind of just falls apart. I felt we needed to do something more economical and something in some ways very operatic, and so that's why this this scene of Hatsumomo's is um, this this is really her final demise. There's a moment here, I guess we just passed it, right, John, where the where where as they were fighting, see you see the lantern has fallen, and that wasn't intended. We choreographed it differently. <laughs> yes, but because it happened, we decided that's how the fire will begin, just as an accident. So sometimes it's great for me anyway to really be on the lookout for mistakes because sometimes they're better than what you have planned. We, we wait for those mistakes. You wait. <laughs> it's hard to pray for mistakes. I'll t we, we choreographed this fight very, very carefully and the incredible thing about these two actors is we started showing them what to do and they, they, they said, what is all this, all this choreography? And they just jumped into it and started fighting with each yeah. other, throwing each other out. And again, so we had physical. doubles for them to, to show them. No, yeah. they, wanted, they no. wanted to do it all no, themselves. No, they had to feel it, yeah. But see, and, and then obviously they come back into the room and the fire is, has already started. And it, 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 it happened, obviously, because of their, because they were fighting and it was it just, and then it was, Instead, of, so right here, obviously, Hatsumomo uses that idea and, and starts to burn down the Sokia, just burn down her life. Unfortunately, she almost did get yeah. burned. She <laughs> did. Her hair up. I have to talk about Gong Li here for a moment because the day we shot this, she never left the set. She needed to feel the emptiness, the, the anger, the, the torture, the sadness, all of it. Um, so as we were relighting things and moving cables around her, she just stood in one spot and never moved and just sat there crying quietly to herself so she couldn't, she would have the emotion you see in that face at the end there. And um, I'll never forget when Pietro uh, and I put the sequence together it was, um, it was all there in, in that performance, and it pays off. I can be a geisha. Now I am geisha to this house. It we was hard to be around her on these days, I remember. Yeah. Well, she takes it so seriously. This is one of those shots that you do that you're afraid you've lost the light. And um, thank God we got it right before the light went. I, we were afraid that the light was too low, I remember, because that's something that's unfair to ask an actor to do over and over again, something, something that emotional. This was another pivotal image. Mm -hmm. We saw, there was a series of, when, during our, our research, we saw this incredible image of a Torah gate with those bombers flying over them, and we said we need to do that in the film because that's the change of the end of a golden era uh, of Japan, the chain, the really, it's it, it, it's sort of perfect in a way that the demise of Hatsumomo really coincides with the demise of the the okay. Japan the Japan that we know, and um, I mean, in many ways I think Hatsumomo does 
represent Japan itself. This, would, this had a profound impact on everyone that would step on this set after they knew it in its, as you say, glory days. Mm -hmm. It really was. I mean, we had to... We dusted down the entire set, and all the beautiful cobblestones, for instance, and streets were replaced with dirt, covered with dirt. Um, all the lanterns ripped to shreds. Right. And... It was really, it was really shocking to walk onto the set. And if you see, um, there's a, there's a sort of a, a tone to the light here. We actually, Dion uh, came up with this incredible idea of covering the entire set in silk to, to be able to control the light. So we never looked like we were in Southern California here. We could, 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 could have this, have the light be what we needed it to be. I mean, in Japan, there was something unbelievably magical about the light. And here, it was important to create a sense of coldness and starkness to the world. You must not go. The city is a prime target. Get your things, quickly. Nova and I are trying to find safe havens for as many of you as we can. Come. Here. Work certificate. NASA's aid. Friend of mine this, here you obviously you see the chairman making sure he's taken care of Sayuri without being, without telling her. He's showing, but he can't say. So he's there to protect her and send her away from harm. This is Arima. He will take you into the hills. No has got a friend there, a kimono maker. Anyone stops you, show them this. To go? It's remote. You will be safe. What about you? You said Osaka was dangerous. Our factory is there. I have no choice. This is um so emotional, I think, ultimately, because will they see each other again, John? You know, will they ever, will, you know, the war, so many, so many, um, People obviously were lost, but mm -hmm. the geisha world was, it was, there was so few left. This water transition and this shot was the most difficult shot in the film because, and it came from actually a budgetary reasons uh, in a funny way, uh, because we didn't have the money really to show Japan during the wartime. And, um, but in an odd way, it forced me to create a transition that would take us through the war that was more poetic and more personal and subjective. So we see Dai obviously coming off, we see Dai in the water, which we believe is blood. And then we realize it's actually Dai coming from the kimono and she is now no longer um, the beautiful geisha Sayuri, but she's an unrecognizable peasant, one of many. And this is all one shot done with a techno crane that we had to helicopter in because where we were was so remote and unbelievably um, muddy. We couldn't, we could barely um, get the, the actors in and out, let alone the equipment. It's freezing cold. Yeah. And slippery, slippery rocks yeah, and a current. I, I remember, John, you were in that water and with... It was. You were in the water with wetsuit on, and mm -hmm. they all had wetsuits on underneath their uh, costumes. Um, it was in January, and it was freezing, and I, and I, I remember, you know, the second we'd see y'all cut, they would go flying out of the water. This, um, this idea of the, the, the kimono being rinsed in, in, in the water and also hung to dry on these bamboo poles is, is very real. And it's um, something that's done in rural parts of Japan. And um, there's an incredible book by Cecil Beaton that had images of, um, of, of these fabrics hanging on these bamboo poles. They're so stunning. And John Meyer and I saw those. He found them and brought it to me. And, and we said, well, this is the perfect place for, to play this scene uh, between Nobu and Sayuri. This is all the remains of our factories. <laughs> and you drove drawn crazy with the colors. <laughs> yeah. You picked everything. Oh, I want this one brown, and there's too many colors. And I know. Well, it's it, funny. It was important, you know, 
obviously the red one needed to be there to m make the transition work. And so we really, I wanted to more earthy colors. I remember when we first got there, there were a lot of very bright ones. It just felt wrong for the sequence. So John being the incredible, <laughs> you know, soldier that he is, he just <laughs> ripped them all down and put up earth tones. If a tree has no leaves or branches, can you still call it a tree? <laughs> With nothing but rubble at my feet. It's extraordinary when you hear Koji speak. He speaks no English, right, John? None. And um, the fact that he was able to act and speak. I mean, I, I really am astounded um, by the work that these actors did to speak English. And it really is a an, an singular achievement. And um, I think in many ways uh, historic that, 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 that we were able to use these international actors in their first English language role. Mm. I need American financing. There is a man, a certain Colonel Derricks, who has the power to grant us a contract. I showed him your picture. <laughs> What's great about um, Z for me here is that she's, you are able to see her older here. You see the, you see the transition. You, she's not just the young 15-year-old. You see the years of the war, and you see the maturity and, and, and the change. And, I, I think she was, she was, you know, even though we shot out of order, she was very aware of constantly what age she was playing and, and where she was in her story. She was only 25 when we shot this. That you could still melt the heart of any man, no matter how resistant. I am not accustomed to... There's a shot coming up here. I remember Steven Spielberg saying, too, it was this his favorite shot in the film because it looks like there's literally water coming this is it right here water coming from her face one of those wonderful happy accidents that you find and love first american face yep this now this is the third time that we changed the, the hanamachi look wise it's now the american occupation this was also shocking, walking onto the set and seeing English signs and seeing chairs at tea houses mm. and obviously, you know, military and uh, vehicles and, and personnel. And but this was all based on r real research we did. You see here now, prostitutes are wearing the white makeup and um, calling themselves geisha. So the line becomes blurred between what a real geisha is and what a prostitute is. And I think that's where this confusion began. And um, the truth is, obviously, the prostitutes are the furthest thing from geisha. <laughs> but the guys would say, I got myself a geisha girl. That's what the, that's what the GIs would say. I got myself a geisha girl. And, um, and I, I think it really is about a, a, about a lost art at least in terms of the amount. It's still there and it's still in incredibly strong, but it's just, a di it's different now, obviously. It's hard to believe this is that beautiful apartment that they did that little dance in and she met her for the first time. It's true. All broken up into rooms. Yeah. Well, Mame is a survivor, ultimately, really. And you see that the tables have turned now. Sayuri now is trying to give Mameha support and encouragement and try to bring her to life as a geisha again. So the roles have switched. I get keep one kimono. The Baron gave it to me when he became my Ganna. Coming up here uh, I'll say is my favorite shot in the film. <laughs> um, it's 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 actually it's it's very simple. It's just a um, it's a close up of Sayuri, but to me it says everything because you see everything in her face in one shot. Right here it begins. How she feels for Mameha, the sadness of the loss of the time, trying to lift herself up, the joy that she's trying to hold on to. I've told Z that, <laughs> and I remember at some of the premieres she'd lean over to me and <laughs> give me a little nudge because she knows that's my favorite. And thank you, Pietro, for showing that to me and <laughs> <laughs> and saying, "What do you think of this?" Which was great. It's 
So she's playing some of the geisha games with mm -hmm. these. This is one. This is ones we played in Kyoto, yep. right, John? Yeah. Played a lot of those paper, scissor. Yeah, they're like children's games. games. Yeah. But I think it's you know men disappear into the tea houses. You know, at that time, obviously, they most of them were were part of arranged marriages, so they didn't really love the women they were married to, and so they they found you know their love in the in 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 the tea houses where they could choose a geisha and that's who they had fun with and that's who they you know had dinner with and and it was accepted mm -hmm. the woman stayed home and a lot mm -hmm. of times they were glad to stay home and have the man go off right different cultures mm -hmm. i'll never forget pumpkin coming onto the set yuki coming onto the set and nobody recognized her she just walked by everybody nobody even even recognized her um in her 40s do here i love this scene for her it's pathetic it is pathetic and we also find out that she's lying through all of this in a few scenes every bit of it is a lie it comes from a deep deep hurt mm -hmm. Yuki Kudo from um, Snow Falling on Cedars and yes. in, in, uh, Mystery Train. Mm -hmm. Here we see the transition of everybody. Mother now, of course. Business woman? Mm hmm. Obviously, not the geisha house isn't making money, so she's uh, running the black market. You see all of her <laughs> stash right here in the old kimono closet. Everything from irons to... Yeah, and you see the little girl there in that last liquor, scene. She's yeah. keeping the, she's keeping her investment going, preparing someone for the future. The threadbare silk. See? You are yourself again. The world had changed completely, had he. Obviously, this transition for Sayuri having to become a geisha again for only one reason. To reach him. I love the scene. Z was supposed to wait for this guy, and she just goes right away. <laughs> she said, we said, why? She said, oh, I'm too nervous. <laughs> the character's too nervous because she she, she, she she has to tell him. She has to finally tell him. And she doesn't even know what he'll look like. Just look at you, Sayuri. It's as if the war did not happen. I'm so glad you see that the chairman is safe. Please accept my apologies asking this again. Well, I think she looks beautiful here. One of the most beautiful. Yeah. Well, she's a radiant human being. Yeah. I, I watch the way she eats, the way she speaks. She's just charmed. Mm, she is. Not unlike a young Audrey Hepburn. You've right. Said. Very much so. And, uh, and Paul Adelstein as a... Uh, Lieutenant Hutchins. A mystery that perhaps you can solve. Would you mind? Can we? Yes. Colonel? Of course. He really, Ted Levine really tread the line, didn't he, John, between, you know, being this kind of smarmy, smarmy <laughs> character and being someone who's, you know, has educated. integrity and educated integrity and classy and did He's, a really great job. Yeah, yeah. He's such a good actor. Many people remember him from Silence of the Lambs. Yes. This character is actually a Japanese character, and uh, I remember Robin in the book. In the book, and and Robin felt it was it would be good to really sort of illustrate um, post-war the compromises they have to make, um, and ultimately, I remember in the book it was a Japanese minister who actually uh, was a character, and and uh, this I thought it made a lot of sense. Dinosaur, specifically because Pumpkin talks about uh, Dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And the three little sisters, the three geisha going off to yeah. try to help the chairman and mm -hmm. noble. In any way they can, obviously. Get their business back on track. Now, this is um, uh, very much per Japanese custom that men and women bathe together. It's such a, such a odd combination of things when you think that you know even just the glimpse of a wrist or the back of a neck is sensual and then and the subtlety of that and then the fact that in a bath they can be together like this and um 
mean, it's not always like this, but this 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 was directly from the book, yeah. and um, different entrances, of course. Yeah. Yes, and it's not sexual. It's um, it's a ritual. And the floating sake trays, and they have they have fruit floating in the water. It's there's nothing quite like the Japanese bath. It's that's why every spa <laughs> that I've ever seen is really based on Japanese culture because it's just it's it's an it's incredible ritual. You don't bathe in them, you soak. If you guess right, the liar pays the price. Oh, it's also freezing cold. <laughs> yeah. The water was warm, though. I we remember, were both John. In the water here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember directing the water in big boots here. Mm -hmm. We were all in the water. A fisherman caught a talking fish. The other story is the true one. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't even had it yet. <laughs> oh, no, no, oh, you drink, you drink, oh, you drink. Only if I drown. It's no, all your, your fault. Turn. So many things happening in this scene with just little glances and looks between everybody. And especially if you watch the movie again, you see what Pumpkin's doing here, what, uh, what, no, how Nobu's feeling, jealous, obviously. The chairman trying to avert um, Sayuri's eyes. Sayuri desperate to do what she's doing right here, and which is desperately trying to connect with him and let him know that she knows who he is. I think we have to stop the game. And obviously, the chairman purposely stopping this game. So there's, there really is so much underneath each of these scenes. It's, there's a whole nother, obviously another layer. I think that's what made it interesting for these actors to play. What is the protocol? Excuse me? I love this moment here, John, because Sir Yuri gets to stand up. You start feeling her strength, and she gets to tell him what a geisha is. It's not what you think it is. If there were a price, you could never afford it. Yes, the mask is a bit taken off, mm -hmm. you know, there. She yeah. does not, doesn't have to play any games with him. Right. What did you promise him? Your company, nothing more. He seemed to expect a great deal. If I had wanted this is another perfect example of working with a Japanese actor and a Chinese actor in one scene, especially a very emotional scene. I remember rehearsing this over and over again because we had to deal with the language issue. But I know uh, Z, for instance, loved working with Koji because he's such a good actor. Can't you see that I want you for myself? You have ruined me. Before we met, I was a disciplined man. I should not have asked you to come. Such a tricky role to play because he loves her and he wants to possess her, which is what she doesn't want. She does not want to be possessed um, as, as an object, which is really how Nobu sees Sayuri. She wants to love freely. And how did he let himself get in this situation? He's always the one that doesn't like Aisha, mm -hmm. you know, and to allow himself this vulnerability is. Mm -hmm. If he ratifies our contract, then I will be a man of means again. There is nothing I want more. Sir. You start feeling that Sayuri is um, is being trapped here, and she. This is the, this. I mean, you start you start to feel it the the, the moment um, that she's at the airplane and Pumpkin arrives and so forth, and and she starts being pulled away from the chairman. But here, it's all the walls are closing in on her. This is this this is where she's feeling. That, she, that something has to change. I do not like being sailed up before me. That I cannot have. When you first introduced me to Nobu. She needs to be proactive now. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just, that's just not a geisha's practice. No. But I really think this, this scene here between Mameha and Sayuri really explains the difference in philosophy. I mean, uh, Mameha really sees that a geisha has no choice. Geisha become geisha without choice. And that's how they live. They put their heart on ice and they don't, they can't have the, the, um, the choice to, to, to the love. The freedom of choice. The freedom yeah. of choice to love. That's how Mameha exists. That's how she, that's how she becomes the great geisha. But that's something Sayuri so, so cannot deal with. 
We don't become geisha to pursue our own destinies. We become geisha because we have no choice. Obviously, that's not enough for Sayuri. She needs, uh, she wants, she needs to uh, pursue her own destiny. And it's the water. You hear the water music. This water music, to me, that John Williams created here, very much feels like drowning. Because I think that that's where she is here. And this, and you, you see this cue. This cue ke keeps going all the way through this whole sequence. It just keeps escalating and escalating. It's nine o'clock. Bring Nobu to the pool on the far side of the garden. Not a minute before, not a minute after. Yes? And please... These, the, uh, John, do you remember both of these shots were done about... So late. Three weeks apart. Oh. Maybe a month apart. I thought you were going to say how late it oh, yeah, they yeah. were. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yes, so, very but far sometimes... Apart, yes. Well, we lost the light. That's why mm -hmm. it was so late. And on Sayuri's side, we lost the light, so we, we, we had to do Pumpkin's Reverse in, in a completely different um, location weeks or months later. Yeah. It's, uh, At least so, one month, yeah. yeah. This is how far she'd go. Yeah, I mean, this is this this is the this is the incredibly humiliating part of it all. Um, obviously, that she has to that she has to go this far to uh, to to rid herself of Nobu and to so that she'll be free to reach the chairman. John Williams score here. John just really, mm. I mean, when you play the sequence without it, it, it's a whole nother, it's a whole nother movie. But to have that tension Are we doing this or not? really makes it. Um, Geisha really kiss. Am I right, John, about that? That's what, uh, yeah, that's what I, was I was told. told. Yeah, because that's something that's so personal. It's funny we say I was told we found a lot of discrepancy. Yes. <laughs> of course, like in any culture. Well, of course, here's the here's the great betrayal. To Denuel. I remember when I've seen it in, in the audience, there's always a gasp there. Mm. Even people that know that read the book. Yeah. Usually. Well, because you just can't imagine that it's not Nobu and you can't imagine that she would do this to her. And then here it's revealed, obviously. It's really classic in nature. Um, this uh, the storytelling here. It's just it's you know. Because I know how you feel about me. A long time ago, you took something from me. The only thing I've ever truly wanted. Deeply sad to me. That's mm -hmm. The scar she'll no, hold forever. Mm -hmm. I remember talking to Yuki a lot about this because it informed her entire character and how she played the latter half of this movie for herself. The wound, which Sayuri never meant to do, you know what I mean? It wasn't, I mean, oh, you know. It's all perception, like right. life, you know. This was actually shot um, in Northern California. And, um, Beautiful shot here hmm. that John, you actually did, <laughs> which was incredible to have her step into that. That was fantastic. I love seeing the hair moving forward and her entering. This, um, uh, the one CGI uh, element here was there was a fence around, but we wanted to remove that uh, so that she would, it would look as dangerous, possible, uh, dangerous as possible as if she would really maybe even possibly jump. This was sad because communicating to her, I was back, way back, on the hill, and she was out there all alone. Yeah. And then, of course, here's our great helicopter shot coming up that we, uh, <laughs> our one, our one helicopter, sh mm. helicopter shot in the film. But it was um, something that's rehearsed and rehearsed over and over again. And uh, it really is, uh, you know, incredible thing to actually accomplish when you can when you can do something with size like this that also tells story. This sequence here was something that we invented actually later on. This wasn't in the script. 
because we needed to feel the sense of time and the f sense of loneliness um, and that she now is really empty, just a vessel, has given up her dream with the handkerchief. Her life is ultimately over and she will be the geisha. She won't be, she will be the perfect geisha now. She will just live a life without, without heart. It's how she's trained, it's how she'll mm -hmm. continue on. This is Japan, obviously a, mm. a beautiful shrine in Kyoto. This is also Japan. This is actually right in the Gion district. The rest is shadows. The rest is secret. Sayuri, quick, quick. The tea house just called. You are to meet a very important client tonight. Part I like about that transition there, what you did was that uh, all the other water is moving, and that's the one. As soon as she goes back to the Okia, the first image is the water and the stones, and the, there's no movement in the water. It really I was. We that. we looked for uh, uh, everything that we could find. Actually, that whole sequence was shot in Japan, every bit of it, and the the uh, the feeling was as we put this together was to create sort of a dead world. Finally. Return on my investment. And you see here, so Yuri's putting on the mask again and starting again, but has um, is hollow inside. No geisha can never hope for more. And that's what she's learning to live by. That no geisha can ever hope for more. That's it. That's your life is 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 something you don't have any say in. Your life is given to you, and you follow, and you don't lead. John Meyer built this um, pathway based on a, a stone path that we saw in the water um, mm. in a shrine in Kyoto, and uh, this is all this is all shot actually in uh, San Francisco. Everything fall that you see here was placed here um, because it really was um, winter. So all the color is something we, we brought in, as was the um, beautiful pagoda that John built here with the, uh, with the bells hanging from them. Well, this scene, John, is the, the scene of the film because it's almost like you work back from this scene. I did that constantly when I was working with Doug Wright or I was working with Robin, it was always about working backwards from this scene um, because this is the r reveal, obviously. This is, it all has to play from here. Chairman, what happened on the island? Please, you do not have to explain. But I have shown myself so We were on this very small platform shooting this, and you know, there were always a hundred grip and a hundred cameramen, a hundred everybody wardrobe everything and we're all out on this little island and it and it is obviously very important that everybody be very still for this emotional scene so that they can play this we all knew how very important this was i would i couldn't even say cut at the end of the scene mm -hmm. every time we shot it we didn't do it that many times because you can't um but i remember everyone was weeping because finally these two you know, it, it, it can say, speak from their heart, and and it's it's interesting. You know, there's this this very sort of grand, big canvas on which is painted this very little small story, and that's what's so interesting. It's a very little story about a young girl and a and a, and a man who changes her life by showing her act of kindness and how she she spends her life trying to reach him and he has loved her all along it's very small and it all ends with this very small moment I cannot live longer I hope it is not too late don't be afraid to look at me Chiyo are you calling her Chiyo again? 
Right. He knew her as a child. He knew who, he knows who she really is. It's more than the geisha, more than Sayuri, this invented persona. Every step I have taken since I was that child on the bridge has been to bring myself closer to you. And we hear Sayuri's theme so beautifully played by Yo-Yo Ma here, and I remember the orchestra when they were playing this, John, I don't know if you remember this, I remember. they were weeping too. I just think it's because it's the release of finally being able to speak. And Sayuri's first real kiss in her life. And as we always say, it's about finally finding the chairman, but it's about much more than that. Mm. It's much more than boy, girl meets boy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's about finding hope in life and being able to um, reach ultimately yourself, I think. Through a connection, mm -hmm. yeah. You cannot say to the I think this um, final voiceover is very profound in many ways because the truth is she'll never be his wife because he is married has children as all um, men do have geisha or most anyway but for her it's plenty um, I think it really is ultimately about a story about a child who's ripped from her family and ripped from love and then ultimately finds love again even though it's not a pure love in our culture, for her, it's enough. And that's why we see this young child running with the joy and the hope of what that love can bring. And still preserving a bittersweet finale. Yeah. This, um... This end sequence was, was, was thrilling to work on with our, the artist Carson Yu because it really was about, obviously about the water and this is once again uh, Isak Perlman playing the chairman's waltz and um, I loved the sort of abstractness of this. I see Steven's name here and he was incredibly encouraging I have to say and uh, helpful along the way. Um, Roger and Gary obviously were our heroes, financially saving us and helping us. And um, I really feel that Amy Pascal at, at Sony was someone, someone who, who championed this for many, many years. And I'm so um, thrilled to work with her because of her passion behind this project. And what's interesting is as you see, you start to see the clarity of what's coming, you see the obviously that it's been a kimono, which I thought was a life, lovely touch. And, and end, end credits are becoming, I think, more popular now because you can get, launch right into the movie. As you see, we have images. This is sort of, in, a, in, in, in some ways, um, like a bow when you say, John. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was important because I... Uh, not many people know these actors, so to be able to connect their name to their face, I thought was good. But also, you remember them. Um, we, I, we did it in Chicago too, and it's something I like. I like I like remembering the and seeing the company. It probably comes from, comes from <laughs> so my work in theater, theater yeah. right? Exactly. So, little bow for each. Yeah. Suzuka. Such an such a extraordinary young woman. Well, thank you for sharing this with us. <laughs> that was thrilling. I had a great time, John. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's what's amazing about film is that it's so much more than just the two hours and 20 minutes. It's, it's you know, it's years of work.